Let's pray together. Father, as we come to you today, I pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and direct us and help us to hear your words. You call us to live like Jesus. Help us to understand what that means and to have the values and have the priorities and the attitudes that you have with the help of your Holy Spirit. Help me to speak clearly in each one of us to hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So how many of you have heard that statement, uh, love God, love your neighbor, and live like Jesus? Anybody hear that before? You ever hear somebody say something like that? Or people say, live like Jesus? Uh, they used to have these little band, and, you know, armbands that people would wear, the, the what would Jesus do? They were, they were pretty popular for a while. So what does that mean, to, to, to live like Jesus? I thought about that, and I thought, well, you know, does that mean that we should, like, get these little robes and wear them around? People, the, uh, scholars think that this is the kind of thing Jesus wore. You know, he, was, he, he wore a little short robe, he did wear the long ones, and um, I think it looked kind of silly that way. If I, if, I, if I did that. Uh, but maybe, or maybe we should get furniture like they had in the first century. Would that work? Anybody want to like change your kitchen so you can, you know, and, uh, nobody's like shooting for that. Or we could like eat food. This, this one's actually not a bad idea. We could eat the food Jesus ate. I kind of like pomegranates. You know, we had pomegranates and fish and bread and that kind of thing. You know, maybe some dates would, would fill in there. Olives, watermelon. You, you guys up for it? You know, we'll eat like Jesus. Yeah, you could, obviously that's not what he's talking about. What it could be is that we're supposed to walk like Jesus. Every, everywhere Jesus went, he walked, right? So it's, we all get rid of our cars and we all walk everywhere that we need to go. <laughs> you up for it? Or, but you're probably up for it because you're know, a really good walker, right? Now, obviously, those are not the things. There's some things that, you know, we can talk about all the different ways in which Jesus lived, uh, but there's some things that Jesus did that we just really can't do, like the miracles that he did. We can't calm the ocean in the midst of a storm. Uh, you know, we can't cast out demons. Yes, as we pray and God's Holy Spirit works through us, and Jesus does that work, sometimes he does it. But ordinarily, we're not doing the kind of miracles that Jesus was doing. We don't turn water into wine, and, and uh, we don't walk on the, on the water, we don't heal blind people, all those kinds of things we don't do. So obviously it can't be that. And the, and, and the biggest thing that Jesus did, everybody knows, right? He died for us. He took the sins of everyone on himself, and he went to the cross and died, and then the third day he rose again from the dead. And obviously we can't die from the sins of the whole world. Right? So what does it mean to live like Jesus? I had a friend that when they had those little bracelets and they were going around real popular, and said, what would Jesus do? He said, well, he died for the sins of all people. You know, that's what Jesus would do, and that's what he did do for us. But obviously there's something to that. We want to live like Jesus, not in being exactly like the man Jesus was and living back in the first century, but we want to live like Jesus. I think it means a couple of different things. In the ways we can live like Jesus, the first one is this. It's attitude. In Philippians it says, your attitude, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And it says, even though he was in the very nature of God, he didn't count his equality with God as something to be grasped, but instead... Made himself nothing in the very nature of a servant. So that servant attitude, we can, we can learn from that, right? With the help of the Holy Spirit. And then the other thing that we can do is we can have the same kind of priorities that Jesus had. And Jesus' priorities are very well said by this verse. Read with me. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to the will of him who sent me. So we can be like Jesus by, by focusing on what God's will is for us. Now, how do we figure out that well? You know, um, we go up on a mountain and pray. I mean, that's a, yeah, I, I read about the Buddha this last week, and the Buddha uh, prayed and prayed and prayed for enlightenment. And he was just, just sat alone until he finally felt like he was enlightened. But the Bible doesn't teach that's the way to do that. The way is that we get into his word and we find out, what did Jesus have to say? How did he, I mean, what, what were his priorities? How did he live on earth? And the story that we have today, I think, is wonderful. It doesn't give us all of Jesus' attitudes and priorities, but it certainly helps us to understand those as we look at this story of the lost sheep. So let's, let's look at that story. Read with me. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. 
Now those are kind of odd terms for us now, tax collectors, uh, we think of the IRS, but at that time tax collectors were Jewish people that were working for the Roman government, and so they thought of them as traitors or, or people that weren't like faithful to their own people, so they were outsiders. But in fact, the term sinners was real broad. It was anybody who had not studied the law. Anybody that, it could be anybody from women. You know, Jewish uh, people at the time would pray, thank God I've not born a woman. What an awful thing to say. And that's what the Jewish people thought. And Jesus, you know, he welcomed women into his, his, uh, his group there. And it could be just ordinary day laborers. People that were workers that didn't have time to do all the temple things. They were considered sinners because they didn't follow the law as exactly as the Pharisees and some of the others did. Shepherds were one of those outs, outs, outsider people, you know, to be a shepherd, to, to work with those animals and to be outside. They were unclean and, and not considered. Or even some of the more uh, clearly unclean, like people that had leprosy or, or blindness or those kinds of things. And those that maybe were notorious sinners, people that like the prostitute that washed Jesus' feet. And those are all the kind of people that are coming to Jesus. They're gathering around him. All sorts of people that just weren't those religious elites were gathering around Jesus. Okay. Read with me. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners into Jesus. See, there's a problem. The Pharisees, the Pharisees, they're like the religious elite, and they had a problem. It wasn't just that they were coming to hear Jesus, that would have been okay. But Jesus welcomed them, and that word actually means hospitality, the idea that he was welcoming, he was hosting them. And when you had a table fellowship with somebody, when you hosted somebody at a meal, usually what you did is if you hosted people that were lower status, you gave them food, and they ate, and then you ate yourself. It's to show your generosity. See how nice I am in helping these people. If you were hosting people that were your social equals, or above you, you would want to eat with them to show your status, right? But Jesus took these outcasts, these people that, that sinners was the word that they used, and he ate with them and he welcomed them to his table. He sat with them and he, he shared meals with them as a social equal. What an amazing thing. So Jesus' attitude here is Jesus honors outcasts as social equals. He takes people that other people weren't respecting. He said, hey, no, no, you know what? We're, 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 we're equals in this. What an amazing thing to have that kind of an attitude. And it makes me think about, you know, who are the people in our world that are, are those sinners or those outcasts in, in our world today? And then how do we treat them? So I, I think about, so, so we can pick a, a group, say, say the folks that are experiencing homelessness in our communities. How do we treat our neighbors experiencing homelessness as social equals? I mean, our temptation is to treat people that are in those kinds of situations as maybe, you know, they're, they're a, uh, a social problem. So we can talk about them, put them in a light little box and talk about them over there. But how would we treat them if we really saw them as our neighbors and loved them? I don't have the answer to that. But you can think and pray about that. How do we treat those people that God puts in front of us as our social people? So you can pick any group of people and think about how do I respect them and honor them as people uh, made in the image of God? Just like Jesus did. Have that same attitude as Jesus. So Jesus is going to explain this. Let's read this. Then Jesus told them of this parable. A parable is a, is a story, but it's a special kind of story. Uh, you see the word there, it says para. Uh, you can think of things like parallel, right? So what's parallel? It's two things that run alongside of each other. A parable is a story that's set aside some, another truth. You know, you lay them alongside each other. Like that is a B-2 bomber, a stealth bomber. And you can look at it, you can learn something about it just looking at it, but how big is that bomber? Unless you've got some experience with it, you probably don't know. But if we lay it alongside of something, a football field, for example, it kind of gives you an idea. It sticks out 12 feet on each side of, of the football field, and you kind of get a, a sense of something more about that bomber, right? That's how a parable works. A parable is, is we lay something in front of you that you're maybe a little bit familiar with, and that tells us about a truth that we're less familiar with, and it helps us to learn more about it. So Jesus uses, he lays things aside on, in, on the, the kingdom of God to help us understand what he's talking about when he's talking about the kingdom of God. So let's look at the parable. Read with me. 
Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. This is great. <laughs> Jesus, I, I, I just think he's awesome. Why? Because who are the people that complain that these Pharisees are complaining about? The sinners, the unclean. And one of the people in that group was who? Shepherds. shepherds. And so he says, hey, you Pharisee guys, suppose one of you is a shepherd. Suppose you have a hundred sheep. He puts them in that role. Now he doesn't labor that point, but he's starting to say, hey, look, you know what, maybe you guys are all in this group of what you call sinners or outcasts. Suppose that you're one of those shepherds, right? And he loses one of his sheep. So he, he, instead of saying it the way that they would normally say, a sheep gets lost, he actually play, throws blame on the shepherd. He says, he loses one of the sheep. So what are you going to do if you lose a sheep? If there's a sheep that's not there, the natural thing to do is what? Read with me. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? He says, yeah. What do you do when you lose something? You look for it. Yeah, you go out and look for it. And that's what the, the shepherd does. But some people made a big deal out of the fact that he left the other sheep in the wilderness. And there's a point there. But the fact is, if you had 100 sheep, you weren't going to be the only shepherd watching them. Maybe 40 sheep, a single shepherd would watch them. Uh, Kenneth Bailey, who does a lot of work on uh, the, the Middle East, he says that as he lived in the Middle East, maybe 40, 50 sheep, one shepherd. Anything more than that, you have at least two, maybe three shepherds watching them. And so he leaves them in the care of the other shepherds, and he goes to look for the sheep. And he's going to look, and he's going to look, and he's going to look. Why? Because he cares about that sheep that's lost. In our world, we call that something. We call that mission. We call that trying to find people that, that need Jesus, which, in fact, is all of us. But Jesus cares about that. He prioritizes that the priority for Jesus is mission. That means he prioritizes reaching to people that don't yet know him, reaching to people that have needs. He prioritizes that. And so if Jesus prioritizes that, and we're supposed to follow Jesus' priorities, we want the Holy Spirit to work in us to have the same kind of priority. Okay? Read with me. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. I love this. You know why? Because what work does the sheep have to do to get restored? Nothing. Who bears the burden of the sheep? The shepherd. And that's the same way Jesus is. It's not like, okay, we're going to go out and find these lost people and then we're going to make them do a whole bunch of stuff so that they can be good church members like us. No. We just let Jesus find them and say, hey, look, Lord Jesus loves you so much. He's going to carry you home on his shoulders. He's going to bring you back into the, into the sheepfold. He's the one that's going to restore you. But in fact, he doesn't bring him into the sheepfold. Where does he take him? Home. That's interesting, right? He doesn't say, okay, he takes him back to the 199 in the wilderness. He goes home. And I think that's intentional. We'll find out about that in a minute. But first, we want to see Jesus joyfully bears the burden of restoring the sheep. He joyfully bears that burden because he loves that sheep. Read with me. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. Now, I'm not a big one for liking um, pictures of Jesus that, that uh, and there's a lot of different pictures out there, but I really like this picture. And the reason is because of that smile. Because you get the idea that when Jesus finds a sheep, he is really, he's stoked. This is cool. <laughs> this, the sheep was lost and now he's home. And all the way through, there's three parables in a row, actually four when you go into the next chapter, but there's these parables in a row and, and one of the things you see is that Jesus is just so happy. When people come back to him, he just loves that. He loves restoration. When relationships are fixed, that, that, that's just the most wonderful thing in the world for him. And so he rejoices at that. Read with me. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And they think, well, if he's so happy about the one sheep, why not the 99? Well, in the parable, where are the 99 sheep? They're out in the wilderness. We don't know if they're home yet. And it's interesting because in the, as you get to the third parable in this group, the one about the prodigal son, have you heard that story before, right? You've heard that story, the prodigal son. At the end of the story, the father goes out to see the elder brother, and the elder brother is still outside. And the question is, will he go into the party, or will he reject his father? 
And that's exactly what Jesus is saying to these folks that are questioning the kind of people Jesus is hanging out with. Hey, are you going to stay out in the wilderness or are you going to come home? Because if they come home, he's ready to rejoice with them as well. Because Jesus rejoices with whoever repents. Whether you're one of those who thinks you're righteous or whether you're one of those who knows that you're not righteous, Jesus wants to welcome you home. That's exactly what he does. Jesus rejoices whenever anyone repents. And that's the point of this whole story. So if we're going to have the attitude of Jesus, if we're going to have the priorities of Jesus, then we're going to rejoice. We're going to rejoice when those people that are somehow, for whatever reason, on the outside, when they come to the inside, we're going to be happy with that. No matter where they come from, no matter what their background is, because that's the attitude and that's the way that Jesus thinks. If we're going to live like Jesus, we want the Holy Spirit to help us to think and have the same kind of attitudes and priorities as Jesus does. Oh, so let's see what we learn first. In, oh, in what ways can we live like Jesus? First, attitudes. attitudes and second, priorities. Jesus honors outcasts as social equal. Jesus prioritizes mission. Jesus joyfully bears the burden of restoring the sheep. And, okay, I get the backwards, sorry. <laughs> uh, Jesus rejoices whenever anyone repents. Yeah, okay. I've talked to the person that puts that together. All right. Um, okay, I'm going to ask a little different question this week. I want you to think about it. How will Jesus' attitude and priorities towards the lost affect my attitude and priorities this week? Well, I think we need to do what Jesus does. Mm -hmm. And if we can get somebody to repent, I'm sure that's And if we get somebody to come back to Jesus, that's wonderful. We all have any thoughts.
Is there anything you'd like to say about the school or let us know? Um, <laughs> good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Um, Little Death Ministry is one of, I think, one of the uh, most amazing ministries at this church because we come in contact with so many people in our community. They come to our door. And um, the teachers and I, through this year and in the past, we try to touch the hearts of all individuals that come, the children and the families. We get the great opportunity of helping them start their new adventures in education, three, four, or five-year-olds. Um, we get to meet the families and get to know them. And uh, through the years, that's been just amazing. We've developed a lot of friendships. And uh, one of the most amazing things is that we get to tell them about Jesus and that he loves them, forgives them, he died on the cross for them. For some students, that might be the only time they ever hear that in their lives. So it's a, truly a blessing to be able to do that. And the school was started in 1986 by Roma, Ludwig, and Jean, um, Pastor Ludwig. And they had a heart for uh, early childhood, and they started. And um, we have built a great reputation, reputation in the community. We now have parents who came to Little Doves bringing their children. We have a couple this year, and that's just truly amazing. It's fun to see them. I've been here long enough that I they go, oh, Miss Linda, you're still here. I said, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Which is awesome. Um, but um, our Roma this year is almost to capacity, just one or two students more. And we're all very excited because we have a lot of new families. And this is a really wonderful staff to work with. They all have a heart for teaching and love for children. And um, so many times I will pray through the years that God will bring the staff that he wants here to Little Doves, that he'll bring the students that he, and families that he wants here to Little Doves, that he'll provide financially, um, and all the support that the school needs, and the support from the congregation that has been here. And he has been consistently answering my prayers. And um, so it's just a trust. And, you know, there's good years and there's bad years. The COVID really gave us a lot of challenges. And we made it through that. And so um, we just are excited for our new year. And we look forward to um, the school touching more and more lives in the future. And I thank God for always blessing it and keeping the kids safe. I always pray for safety because that's important too. And um, he's going to do that because we trust him. And so we're excited. And I have a wonderful staff, Lynn, Jennifer, and Natanya. And um, we also ask that you pray for our Little Doves constantly, too. It takes the whole community as at peace here. It's your school, too. Um, it's everybody's ministry. So you're always welcome to join in and participate wherever you would like to. So just let me know if you ever want to participate when we have events coming up. We have a drunk or treat on October 28th and then other things, so thank you. And you're always welcome to, to join um, for the uh, last, uh, last week of the month, there'll be parent chapels, which is on Thursday, or Wednesday and Thursday, and those chapels are open to all of the parents and all of you, so if you are open at uh, 1145 um, on the uh, last Wednesday or Thursday, come, because they get to meet the parents. Also, we sometimes do that Jesus Java where we have coffee for parents as they come in the, the school. You're welcome to come there too to help and, and get to know people and let them know how much we just appreciate having their kids uh, be here and how much we love them. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. All right, this is the staff of Little Doves. That's the school that the Lord has has given us to be able to support. Are you, as God's people in this place, are you willing to support? The ministry of Little Doves through your prayers and through your encouragement. Are you willing to do that? If so, then say, we will. We will. Okay. All right. Well, you guys, you're uh, serving on behalf of the congregation, and we're so thankful that you're willing to do that. Are you willing to be able to serve this year as teachers in this school? Okay. Wonderful. Well, then let's give thanks to God and let's pray for our teachers. Father, we're so thankful.
uh, that we have the ministry of little doves where you bring people into our building where we can point them to the love of Jesus. I pray uh, first, I, I give you thanks for the wonderful blessing that you've given us in these teachers that are, are willing to serve here and that you have gifted with the ability to serve these little children. I pray that each and every day you'll strengthen them and encourage them and that you keep away discouragement and allow them to be true blessings to each and every family that comes here. Father, we pray your blessing on the school, on Linda and her leadership, and we ask that all that we do through Little Doves will allow people to know how much you love them. Watch over us today and every day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Make sure you greet folks after the, the service. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Yes, what a wonderful thing. So we're very thankful for the school. Now, if you please.